Oh, sorry. I was just looking at a bunch of naked bitches. F I didn't see you there. No, but seriously, um, constantly nutting out of your wiener sounds like a pretty good idea until you unveil the dire consequences. Like many young men, I spent my teenage years completely addicted to online pornography. However, at the time, I didn't realize I was addicted. I thought it was a perfectly normal and even beneficial habit to play with my worm and watch adult films. In fact, when I was like 13, I had a little bit of questioning whether it was good or not, so I looked it up on Google. I said, is this wrong? Is this bad for your health? And lo and behold, what did it say? It's not wrong at all. It reduces stress, it releases endorphins, it decreases your chance of prostate cancer, all this stuff. They said it's physically healthy. So I was like, okay, swag, affirmative. That's totally lit. I'm about to go sicko mode on my glizzy. Of course, that ended up being wrong. And I and many other people have analytic, scientific videos about why this is the case. But today I wanted to take more of a reflective, emotional angle and talk about specific things in my adolescence um, that were destroyed by this addiction. Because a ton of guys start this addiction when they're like 11, 12 years old, within the range of 10 to 13, that's when the vast majority of guys will start having this problem. And these are your formative years. I mean, I remember back in my high school days, um, 2001 when I graduated, back when the towers fell, when the towers came crumbling down, I was sitting in class and they rolled in the, the, uh, the cart with the TV on it and we saw him crumble to the floor. And I remember my crush was actually very sad and scared at the time. Her father was at the World Trade Center. So I was trying to comfort her. Of course I had, you know, ulterior motives, but she was dating the, uh, the quarterback of the football team, you know, the stereotypical jock. Make a short story short, he ended up dying. And I joined the football team my senior year and I took us to new heights. You know, we won every game won the championships, I reestablished a connection with my father, and it was a great experience for high school. Just kidding, I was at home milking my creature the whole time. The, my entire high school experience can be boiled down to me in a, in a dark, damp room, choking my little Peter. For almost all my teenage years, I was a chronic beater, and I can't get that time back, which is a bummer, but I'm glad I learned to stop as soon as I did. And uh, in the spirit of No Nut November, even if you failed already, you should kick this habit completely. Um, if you're not convinced, maybe this will help. If you are convinced, maybe this will be entertaining and it will help you on your journey of stopping completely. Towards the end of the video, I will give more specific tips, but I think just stay in there and listening to these experiences that you will probably resonate with. I think that in itself will help you a lot if you're struggling um, because it attacks at a more emotional angle. So as I mentioned, when I first turned 13 is when I began to stray from the Lord's light, shall we say. And looking back, something changed around this time. I started feeling real social anxiety. Prior to this time, as a kid, I remember feeling a little shy or nervous from time to time, but nothing that was unnatural because there's an implicit amount of social anxiety or nervousness that's just normal in a lot of situations. But socializing back then when I was a kid was usually just fun. I was pretty carefree, I didn't overthink anything, I liked meeting new people. But there was a shift around this time where it became a lot less fun and uh, extremely stressful. And eventually it became more like a chore, more like working out or eating healthy, like something you do to uh, make yourself uncomfortable but you feel better afterwards. No longer a normal amount of stress anymore. It's I'm, I'm doing breathing exercises right before I go to hang out with people. Of course, other things change around this time. Social dynamics change quite a bit and you naturally gain more inhibition as you get older. I'm not claiming that wanking to titty literature was the sole cause of my anxiety at the time. More so that it 
amplified it to a very unnatural degree, way further than what would have been normal for things that naturally happen around this age. And we have neurological data from fMRI scans and peer-reviewed research that show us that people who frequently utilize cooter cinematography have increased amygdala volume and reduced connection between the amygdala and prefrontal cortex. Chronic social stress is directly related to increased amygdala volume, and this makes sense because the amygdala controls your fear response. We know that sex addicts have overactive stress systems. We also know from cross-sectional studies on adolescents that visiting yank sites was associated with interest in sex, low mood, lack of concentration, and unexplained anxiety. There are many more papers or experiments I could name. A good one is this mediation analysis that showed social anxiety and loneliness were positively correlated with sex streaming. So we now have proof of both a causation and correlation to conclusively say beyond a shadow of a doubt, that being a coomer causes social anxiety. Social anxiety specifically because of the large amygdala, but this also extends to stress in general because it leads to a dysfunctional HPA axis. So there was a certain point where I thought I had generalized anxiety. Nothing would be going on and my heart would still be beating too fast and I would be freaked out just trying to chill at the crib. At a certain point, I also thought I had insomnia because this anxiety was disrupting my sleep. I couldn't get any sleep. Um, it got really bad. I was in my bed shaking for hours, not able to sleep at all. It was actually truly horrific. Um, I do attribute this to use of online bang video because after I started to stop at age 17, I wasn't anxious anymore. I still had social anxiety, it got better, but the generalized anxiety completely went away. So that's pretty bad, and the fact that this is exposed to kids when they're 11, 12 years old is nothing short of evil. I jacked off so much that I got scared. But let's look back at this adolescent study that found that Goinky was not only associated with anxiety, but also lack of concentration. And this one right here did a number on When I was a kid, I was diagnosed with ADHD, but borderline. Of course, growing up with TV, video games, and later the internet made it worse. But the way uh, the griggity short circuits your brain is a different beast entirely. Because again, this age is your formative years. It's at this age where you start to develop skills and hobbies and things that you could use for the rest of your life that form your identity. This is also when you're in school. And when you're unable to concentrate and your attention span is terrible, your creative and productive potential is completely stifled. It doesn't really matter how smart you are. If you cannot focus, you're effectively special. Or as we would say it in the scientific community, you're being a retard. Of course, I found it very hard to do essays and school work. I just watched Vixen. How am I expected to do math? My frequent and severe yanking not only affected my academic performance, but also rigged my adolescent Zoomer brain to make it extremely hard to concentrate on anything that was not immediately gratifying. Again, when I was 17 and I stopped, I started getting actual hobbies that were not consuming media. And by the way, you know, if you're in your 20s or later and you haven't stopped yet, it's never too late to become a happier, healthier person. So don't don't hold that against yourself. My circuits were fried. All I was able to do was go to school, do the minimum work required, and then just consume media for the rest of my free hours. No actual hobbies, working towards anything, building skills. Um, and if I would have stopped earlier, I would be way doper. Uh, at shit. And again, this is also proved by science. Not only do we have the correlation that I talked about earlier, but also fMRI scans showing reduced gray matter in frequent incognito mode users. Having reduced gray matter means that you can't properly compare rewards and your ability to experience pleasure and control your behavior is compromised. This isn't because you run out of dopamine like some people would suggest or like a lot of people would try to straw man this neurological data by saying. 
it has to do with the pathways that your dopamine takes. There's a long pathway called the mesocortical and a short pathway called the mesolimbic. And basically what happens through a variety of brain processes is one pathway becomes highly preferred over the other, this being the mesolimbic pathway, the very short, immediate one uh, that's, you know, it's immediate gratification. This becomes the one highly preferred, making you unable to do things uh, that you have to put a lot of work in in order to get this dopaminergic reward. Hence the term short-circuiting your brain. Uh, you're making it so your brain can only take the short pathway. And I could go on about other things, you know, being depressed, my dick skin hurting, wasting a lot of time, getting nut on my new shirt. The last thing I wanted to talk about is something that's less empirically observable, but it's something that I have experienced, and it's true. When you watch a lot of porkumentaries, you become obsessed with sex. You think about it a lot more. It's a misconception that abstaining from watching tit lit um, will make you more horny or make you think about sex more. That going on no fap, your balls are just going to get real heavy and you'll just become a beast that only thinks about nutting. It's actually the exact opposite. Watching this stuff and frequently nutting is what turns you into a hornball. It makes you hyper focus on sex, thinks about it way more. It's an excuse you always use when you relapse or when you end up going to the accursed site. I gotta relieve myself. I gotta let all this go, blow off some steam. There is no relieving. You're only greasing the wheels, feeding the beast, the beast of lust inside you that you want to die, that you want to starve. There's no getting rid of anything, there's only building it. Back when I was a nutter, I had frequent pornographic fantasies going on in my head, always getting bricked up in math class. The type of wild scenarios I would envision in which I ended up getting my meat sucked were simply absurd. And the only place I could have possibly learned these kinds of themes to create these stories in my head is from Brazzers. Um, it was a truly twisted and sick mind frame to be walking around with. And I have to say, I do think it changed the way that I looked at women. Because I couldn't look at them without imagining some dastardly thing. That actually has been empirically observed, though. That's just the framing. What I really wanted to talk about is how thinking this way makes you weird. Makes you uh, give off a creepy vibe that people pick up on. You see, you can usually tell if someone is chronically online. They give off a peculiar vibe. You can usually tell a stoner or a gamer. On the flip side, you could usually tell an athlete. People give off an energy that you pick up on. Not always consciously, but subconsciously often. And it doesn't even have to be fugazi. It's just their predominant mental attitude what they do a lot, what they think about and manifests in their body language, in their facial expressions, um, and often what they say or what they do. You could tell when someone's a coomer. The soulless nut eyes are a very real thing. Also, they'll be always fixated on sex. Like, you could be talking about anything. You could be talking about Spongebob. And out of the blue, they'll just be like, I wonder if Sandy has a wet... So you gotta think. I'm addicted to watching Johnny Sins and his contemporaries digging out broads on camera and I'm constantly having these weird ass fantasies in my head. People can tell. And I had the look, I have to imagine there was something subconsciously unsettling about the vibe. I said weird shit and I could often tell that the hoes did not find my presence comforting nor attractive. It was bad. People would say things like, you look like a crackhead. And it hurt my feelings, but they were low-key kind of right. And it was partially because of my build, but I would like to think that the uh, nutter physiognomy contributed quite a bit as well. And before I go, here's some pieces of information that will help you beat the addiction forever. Here's a little secret. The actual addiction to the hub is not very strong. 
especially compared to substance addictions, the withdrawal is very mild. The actual chemical addiction isn't crazy. It gets really bad because you're doing it all the time, but the reason it's so hard to quit isn't because of the actual addiction. It's because it capitalizes on your natural instincts to want sex. The actual addiction is mostly gone after one week and pretty much completely gone after three weeks. But you will still feel urges and be able to easily get back into it after three weeks simply because you will always get horny from time to time and your expression of this horniness has become wanking off. And that is a neural connection that doesn't go away very fast. That's a lifetime decision of never PMOing again in order to break that. So the first thing you should understand is that you don't want to watch the hub, you want sex. That's just what it is. You never did want to watch the hub. If you think back on it, it actually took you a little while to find it enjoyable in the first place because it's not something naturally fun to watch two people bang on a screen. You have to establish the connection in your brain. It wasn't immediately uh, sweet if you remember the first time you did it. The second thing I want to tell you is what to do when you get an urge. You have to look at urges the right way. They're not a bad thing. Every urge is good. It's a gift. It's like free condensed packaged energy that you could use for anything. Whenever you get an urge, don't be like, oh no, be excited. Look at it as a gift, a blessing, an opportunity. Every urge is an opportunity. And what you do when you get an urge is you don't want to fight it. Fighting it would be things like starting to pace around and really start considering and breaking down why you shouldn't or shouldn't do it, or uh, doing a bunch of push-ups, or starting to immediately do something. You don't fight it. When you get an urge, all you do is sit still, completely still. Try to be perfectly still for two minutes. That's the, that's the plan. When you get an urge, sit still for two minutes and notice what's happening in your body. Normally what will happen when you get an urge, for me, is a accelerated heart rate. Um, there's this feeling. There's this feeling and you want to completely feel that feeling and just let it pass through you. Fighting it, the act of fighting it, is actually an energy that it will use against you. So you don't want to give it that. So whenever you get an urge, sit still, be thankful, calm down, and move on. There's your plan. Thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, all my shit. Have a blessed day.